Good evening and thank you for joining us. Tomorrow night, Thunder Bay City Council will be presented with a 2024 budget direction report, which suggests a 6.57% 6 tax hike next year, or 6% after growth. The report says the significant tax increase will be necessary to contain rising costs without cuts to service. The council will have the option to modify those targets at tomorrow's meeting. Historically, City Council has approved tax hikes slightly lower than what has been recommended by staff. If Council wants to reduce the tax levy hike down to 5%, you'll need to find $2.2 million in service cuts. The largest increase in recent memory was in this year's budget, which saw a 4.4% increase after growth. The Skantica First Nation is asking the Ontario Superior Court of Justice to weigh in on the province's duty to consult when it comes to developments in the Ring of Fire. The First Nation made their case at a hearing in Toronto last week. They're arguing that Queen's Park is not living up to its obligations under the Environmental Assessment Act. Chief Christopher Munez says the Ford government is pushing ahead with road and resource development in the Ring of Fire without proper consultation or the free, prior and informed consent of the people of Nistantica. Consultation in our, in our, in our view has been not happened. Because uh, because of the uh, you know the crises the uh, the the evacuations we had during the pandemic and uh, the uh, boil water advisory for 28 years and the uh, community hasn't been able to uh, meet consent hasn't happened and it will not happen until uh, we're uh, properly consulted and accommodated. A spokesperson for the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry declined to comment saying it would be inappropriate while the matter is before the courts. Marina Park was filled with colour and cheer for its 14th annual Festival of Colours. Attendees were brought together to celebrate Indian culture, throw their worries away, and fill the skies with, colors of, with clouds of bright colours. Jessica Clement reports. An Indian tradition that goes back thousands of years, the Festival of Colors is a joyful reminder to cast away bad feelings and worries into the wind. Hundreds came out to this year's event to enjoy the music, dancing, and the chance to cover their families, friends, neighbors, and themselves in brightly colored powder. Blue, orange, pink, green, yellow, and purple could be seen on almost everyone in attendance. Organizer Dr. Prashant Jani says the color throws are done in a safe way as the colors are non-toxic and environmentally friendly. They are made from corn and you can eat it. I don't recommend eating, but they are very safe, environment friendly, healthy, and they are certified colors. So most welcome to use all the colors. Color throws happened every 40 minutes with interactive dances happening in between. Smiles could be seen the whole time. And we spoke to some colorful attendees who said the event is always on their summer bucket list. It's just awesome to see the community coming together to celebrate um, India and it's just fun to see everybody doing all the colors and dancing and it's great, it's fun. Everyone's so friendly and like everyone gets together and just has a great time. The Color Festival has been going on in the city for 14 years and Johnny says the event keeps on growing every year. He says he's happy to be able to share this piece of Indian tradition with the community. Color throw is like a unique fun event and everybody loves food, music and colors, you know. So it's a universal phenomenon. So it's a universal culture, I would say. Jessa Clement, TVT News. Thousands of country music fans made their way to Fort William Historical Park this weekend for the second annual Country on the Bay Music Festival. The three-day event saw a number of country artists hitting the stage, including James Barker Band, Tim Hicks and Doc Walker. Well, I'd never tell her she's been bust. The weather held out for the local festival goers, young and old, who were enjoying the food, drinks, and live music. Organizers saw around 5,000 people per day and are hoping to see more next year. Co-promoter David Allen says this year's event ran a lot more smoothly than last year and adds that the next festival will see some more changes. 
we're going to look at uh, doing a little bit bigger next year and some bigger bands. Um, not that we haven't had big bands, but we're going to try to bring some bigger ones in and, and have it a, a make it a, a main attraction for the city for the, every year going forward. We've got four more years of a, you know, to, to try to do it and re you know, talk to the old fort and see where we want to be. But I think the old fort and our group together is, is uh, trying to make this uh, a, a yearly thing that's going to uh, be good for the city. Some local students had the opportunity to experience the skill trade of carpentry firsthand this week. With the help of Carpenters Local 1669, students enrolled in a summer learning program and took part in a bird house building activity to promote the skilled trades. Local students were able to take part in some hands-on learning and better understand a potential future career path. Lake had public students heading into grades 5 to 7 involved in the summer learning program, took a trip to the Carpenters Local 1669, where they were able to learn more about the trades. The kids were able to build their very own birdhouses, which they were able to take home, with the help from a number of skilled workers in the field. Super engaged today, as you can see, um, and they're just they're loving it. Ontario Youth Apprenticeship recruiter Roger Dercher was there helping out, and says the event's a great way for kids to learn more about the field. We really want to bring uh, to the forefront that uh, apprenticeship pathway, uh, skill trades pathway is a post-secondary destination and it's uh, a viable pathway for students to start considering at a young age and uh, as just as they would consider college and university. The event was also a way to support women in carpentry who are underrepresented in the trades. Recent graduate Jania Caper was there to share some of her knowledge and was happy to see the excitement from the girls taking part. The girls here right now are a lot more engaged than the guys are, and that's huge. <laughs> it's, um, if I had someone like me or someone as a female that was representing um, the females, like the girls going into the trades, I probably would have been a lot more willing a lot more sooner to go into the trades. And with the students being so engaged during the event, it was clearly a nice way to get out of the classroom. It's, it's fun here because you get to skip school and I like using the power tools because I always use them a lot. After a late start due to weather, construction at Marathon's Pebble Beach is well underway. Carl Langdon reports with an update from the site. With summer in full swing, Pebble Beach remains closed to the public. We caught up with Mayor of Marathon, Rick Dumas, who offered us an update on the expected date of completion. Uh, they got off to a little bit of a late start uh, because of the weather in the spring, you know, with the freeze up. And uh, so it was about a month behind. So we're going to hopefully have our park back by uh, late September, early October. This does mean the public won't have the chance to enjoy Pebble Beach this summer, but a mid-autumn date of completion should offer beautiful sights from the new scenic viewing area. We had to revisit the, uh, the tender and uh, work with the local contractors who put a bid in and reduce the amount of stuff happening. We were going to put a campsite, uh, you know, an enhanced uh, playground area. We had to reduce those and just went to the boardwalk, uh, landing area, scenic view area, uh, parking lot, and steps down to the lake. And, you know, we're talking well over a million dollars for that portion of it. So, With Marathon having a population that's just over 3,000, putting together funds for an amenities project costing over $1.3 million is easier said than done. But money from Ottawa and the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund ultimately helped move the plan from concept to shovels in the ground. We always talked about enhancing it, but of course it's always about money. So, you know, with the, f the help of the uh, provincial and federal governments, we're able to do those things. And that's always it's about partnership and working with uh, the other levels of government. The provincial grant came out to $450,000 of the project's total cost. Part of the NOHF sees efforts to fund tourist and community well-being projects in the region. Carl Langdon, TBT News. For locals and cross-country travelers alike, the long-awaited reopening of the Burger Scoop in Ignace was a big deal for an area where food options are few and far between. I'm going to be honest, I didn't think it was actually going to reopen. For the last three years, they said it was going to be reopening. But now that it's open, it's nice. I've been here almost every day to get some ice cream. It's exciting to have it back because it has such a... It was the most known thing. People would come across Canada just like, oh, I can't wait to eat the Burger Scoop. So we're from Maple Ridge, British Columbia, and we're heading down to Prince Edward because it was our bucket list. And we just came here because we're hungry and we wanted something to eat. And this restaurant looked pretty cozy and chill, so we just decided to come here. Whether Ignace born and raised or just passing through, 
Customers agree that it's nice to have another option for food in the area. For many, the roadside diner is a beloved summer staple. That includes new owner Miriam Cook, who fell in love with the burger scoop on her frequent trips between her home in Thunder Bay and her community of Slate Falls Nation. I've stopped here many, many times over the years since it's been open. Um, since I can remember, uh, I've always stopped in here for the burgers and the ice cream. I officially bought it last summer. It was about July. Uh, the place had been closed for about three years. And it's taken a lot of work to open up. Cook says they're still working from the original recipe book and that she's gotten great feedback from diners who have been keeping them busy since the reopening.